morning again, everyone. It is really good to be together. Welcome to anyone that has slipped in during that time or perhaps tuning in and going to be watching this on YouTube. It's great to have you with us as we kind of introduce what is going to become from next week, a new series looking at Jesus as our kind of core foundation and value for understanding our purpose in life, who we are, that he's our model, the foundation for learning how to live life well in this world. So today is something of an introduction to that, and we're going to get going with that series next week. Now, does anybody know what day it was on Friday in terms of the Christian kind of liturgical year? Anyone try? What's that? Epiphany. Okay. So I am... Um, oh, it's up there. Okay. <laughs> well, there you go. I gave you a clue. Um, <laughs> So uh, as, a, as a historically, as sort of Baptist in South Africa, we didn't really track very carefully in our stream with the liturgical year. And I think we lost some of the opportunity to feast because this is what this was. So as a staff team, we had our Christmas staff lunch on Friday on Epiphany, a celebration. A and really traditionally, for those of you that don't know, like me, was the case for a long time, Epiphany was the time in the year, is the time in the year when a wide spectrum of the church celebrate and remember that God was revealed to the world in the person of Jesus. This revelation of God, not only to the Jewish people, but to the Gentiles too. So sometimes known as Three Kings Day, because it was a kind of a time they remembered the kings came to Jesus and gave the gifts, and so this was this moment of the revelation of God in Christ to the wider world. And so I thought in light of that, it would be nice to take an opportunity this morning and kind of unpack a little bit of the biblical idea of how it is today that we engage with the revelation of God to us in Christ and actually engage with what we've been singing about, to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus and how amazingly transformational that is in our, in our lives. So if you have your Bibles, okay, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to read into the first part of chapter 4. So uh, you can open that up, and I will pray for us, because there's a sense in that some of the things we're looking at today, we can read them and understand them, and at least understand the words, but God wants to bring us into much more than that to actually experience the spiritual reality of what is being spoken about in these scriptures. And we really need God's help for that. And I really need the Holy Spirit's help to be able to speak into that and for us to listen together. So let me pray for us as you kind of thumb your way to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So Father, I ask that as we come to you to celebrate that it was your purpose to reveal yourself to us, that you're the God who wants to make yourself known. You want to reveal your glory to us, that we could see it and celebrate you and be with you and be transformed and changed in that process. And so God, I pray wherever any of us are on our journey of relationship with you, whether we're just starting out, whether this is kind of, uh, we, we really mature in this process of discipleship to Jesus, I pray that you would help us to see higher and deeper the glory and goodness of God in the face of Jesus. May we behold afresh today, God, your glory and the wonder of who you are and just chip away and shake off of us perhaps the, the broken mindsets, the incomplete ideas, the diminished view that we have of you. Just think of how how people would see you when they saw you for who you were, when there was the, the transfiguration or John in Revelation as he sees Jesus and he sort of falls at his feet as though dead. Such is the glory and wonder and goodness and joy and peace and power of God that is revealed in Christ. Just shake off any weak views that we have about who you are that our hearts would come to worship. As we contemplate you, Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. 
Amen. Okay, so just to give a bit of background, because some of the language as we just jump into the middle almost of the argument here uh, might seem strange. So just to give a bit of context, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, what Paul has been doing, he's been referencing back to a moment in Israel's history, Exodus chapter 34, if you want to take notes and go and read it for yourself. There's this interesting account where Moses is spending face-to-face time with God. So Moses is allowed to come into the very presence of God. And and so close is the relationship, so humble is Moses, that he is afforded this opportunity to literally be in the sort of undistilled presence of God and to communicate with him. It says that God spoke to him as with a friend, as face-to-face. And the thing was, Moses would come away from these moments of being with God in his glory in that way, and and literally his face would shine with the glory of God. He was so transformed through that encounter and experience that the people were afraid to then be with him. And so he had to put a veil over his face so the people wouldn't see it and then wouldn't see the fading of that glory later on. And so Paul does this interesting thing. He he links the veil that was there to prevent the people of Israel seeing the glory of God in the face of Moses to the challenge that the people of Israel were currently having with seeing the glory of God in the face of Christ. And this veil that was before them And how as they come to Christ and believe the gospel, the veil is removed and they, like Moses, are able to behold the glory of God face to face with Jesus and actually see him. Really amazing kind of thing that he does. So we'll pick it up in verse 16. Uh, I'm reading from the the current version of the NIV, so I'll mention where it it sort of deviates slightly from the Bibles in the church. Okay, Uh, chapter 3, verse 16. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Amen. <laughs> okay, this is really good news. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom to connect with God, to be who God's called us to be, to live into all the reality and dimensions of the kingdom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. Now, if you're reading in an older version of the NIV, it might say reflect the Lord's glory. And just to clarify that, because that's kind of a different thing, the reason for that is the Greek word here, it's only used here in the New Testament, but in classical Greek language, it was used to contemplate your face in a mirror. So it's one of the Greek words you use for seeing, but it's seeing reflectively. And the idea is, if, if, there, if there was someone standing over here and we had one of these black screen petitions between us, I wouldn't be able to see them. But if there was a mirror over there, I would be able to see them in the mirror. Does that make sense? And so what's being spoken of here is we don't see the glory of God directly. We see the glory of God in a mirror, and the mirror we're going to discover in chapter 4 is Christ. So we behold and contemplate and encounter and experience the glory of God as in a mirror reflected in Christ. Contemplate the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Okay, go on, verse 1 of the next chapter. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, the revelation of the truth, revealing the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, so he's talking about now how when we do this and people don't get it, they don't understand it, it is veiled to those who are perishing, who do not yet believe, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. 
verse 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, speaking about the creation of the world, made his light shine in our hearts to give us, through this mirror, to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God displayed in the face of Christ. Of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power is from God, not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Okay, if we had more time, we could read on. But just to frame some of this up, I thought I'd give a natural example of how this process of being transformed by what we experience at a spiritual level actually takes place by looking at the way it happens in a natural level. So I, I watched a, a fascinating lecture okay, on experience-dependent neuroplasticity. Really interesting stuff, everybody. I mean, this is the kind of thing that I do on YouTube by Bruce Rexler, who is the professor of psychiatry, the lead professor of psychiatry and senior research scientist at the Yale School of Medicine. So I am right out of my depths here in what I'm talking about, but I will dumb this down to the level that I understood it and therefore hopefully not butcher the science of it as I share it with you. Okay, but as I understand it, and I'll, I'll, I'll do it with an illustration first. First of all, our minds are amazing. I think that's what I took away from this, this lecture on the, how this applies to education. Our minds are amazing. And what's amazing about them is they're not like this wood. I do a bit of woodwork. I've done it my whole life. It's a way of being creative, and I like I didn't make this. I, I found this upstairs. But it's a, <laughs> it's a piece of wood. Now, what's great about wood is you can shape it, can't you? You can cut it. You could chisel it out. You can sculpt with it, which is wonderful. It looks beautiful when it's finished. But once you have shaped it and cut it and molded it, you can't put it back to its original position. It's like a scrambled egg. Once it's scrambled, it's scrambled. Once it's cut and chiseled, it's chiseled. Our brains are much more like this flexi light that we got for the carol service, okay? Which you can move and bend and turn according to the need that you have. It adjusts to help you and serve you in your life. Or another way to think about it is, I have my phone here on purpose. Now, um, my phone doesn't have a lot of storage space. Any of you wrestle with this? So it has this neat feature where it dumps the apps that I'm not using a lot. I mean, I try to keep a lot of apps off my phone anyway. But if I don't use an app a lot, it just deletes it. It sort of there, but I'd need to reload it again to use it. So now suddenly you're in a shop and you need the app and you go to use it and it's not there and you've got to re-download it. But as you re-download it, it's now there and you can use it quickly again. And our brains are a bit like this. They are constantly adjusting. This is something that we've really just discovered. We thought they were a lot more wooden, particularly by the time we get to adulthood. What we've discovered, or scientists have discovered, I had nothing to do with it. What we've discovered... <laughs> is that our brains can adapt much more than we originally thought. And they adapt via our experiences. Our experiences literally change and shape and retool the neural pathways in our brains so that we can do the things that we do more often, more easily. So that as we find ourselves repeatedly experience something, repeatedly doing a particular task, our brain adjusts to be able to do that more readily and more quickly and more efficiently. Another way you could say this is we have been designed for transformation. You at a neurobiological level are designed to change and to grow. Isn't that wonderful, actually, when we think about what God wants for our life? Psychologist Karen Young put it like this, everything you experience will alter the physical structure of your brain in some way. The things you do, the people you spend time with, we literally become like those we live with. <laughs> for good or bad, <laughs> okay, some of you thinking, oh no, <laughs> okay, <laughs> the, thing, the people you spend time with, every feeling, thought, automatic experience will influence the wiring of your brain to make you who you are and critically 
who you can become because they change the capacity of your brain to work for you in whatever situation you're in. Now, that means, on the one hand, our past experiences have had a massive impact on who we are today, how we live, how we think, how we feel, and how we engage with the world around us. But also, they don't have to determine our future because they can change. And the things that we recognize in us that God needs to grow and develop in us really can grow and develop. You are not the piece of wood. You are the flexi light that can shift and adapt as we experience and curate our experiences with God. So some of you, for example, might have found yourself over the last couple of years feeling just a bit more anxious, or at least perhaps your spouse or friend might have told you that you seem to be more anxious, or afraid, or if not depressed, then perhaps just a bit more flat. And wouldn't that make sense based on what we have all experienced? We've lived through this global pandemic. So much has been about fear and anxiety and the loss of control. And you know, coupled with that, the war that's happening, the financial implications of everything. If you are on the news regularly, your brain has literally been wired towards anxiety and fear. Now, that doesn't mean you necessarily are now a completely anxious person, but you probably have a greater capacity now to quickly move towards anxiety compared to before the pandemic. Okay. Equally, those of you who are now in a connect group and engaging and hanging out with those people and we're going to do a meal this week and you're spending time with them and you're celebrating and you're debriefing what's happening, that experience is also shaping and changing our capacity for relationship and for joy and for hope. To frame all of this up in the language of the Bible we become what we behold. And that is true at a natural level, and it's also true deeply, profoundly, at a spiritual, supernatural level. You know, we had read earlier, um, thank you, John, from uh, John chapter 1 John 3 verse 2. <laughs> Get that right. 1 John 3 verse 2. And the passage that we've just read, I think we could perhaps distill that one way at least that we could distill. Got to be careful. What is my purpose in life? Jason told me on Sunday in a nutshell. Okay, it's broader than that. But one way that we could distill our God-given purpose in life is this, that our purpose in life is to become like Jesus as we increasingly delight in seeing him for who he truly is. And one day we will see him fully and we will what? Be like him. There is this link in the New Testament between what we see and behold experientially. Okay, remember the whole imagery in this passage that we've read is Moses face to face with, the, with God. It, in his presence. It's an encounter moment. And as we see and encounter the glory of God, there is this amazing partnership that happens between the Holy Spirit, who sort of brokers this exchange of us being able in our spirits to recognize the glory of God for who he is. And, and we all have a measure of understanding. And every time we meet with God, God wants to take us further and higher and deeper in what we can see and our ability to bring ourselves before God in that moment. And, and it's important that we, we don't miss this seeing of the Lord is not just a meditative exercise where we think about the truths of the Bible. Now, that is really good. I'm a big advocate of that. Meditate on the word night and day. You can hear I was doing that last night. You know, we want to be doing that all the time. It's how we retool our brains to think the way that God thinks. But this is, this is a level deeper than that. This is I'm actually meeting with and seeing and experiencing the power, glory, goodness, and wonder of Jesus. And the truth of who God is, I'm engaging with at a spiritual level 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we do get some clues in the passage that this isn't always going to be easy and straightforward. So I'm not sure who, who had a time like this this morning before coming <laughs> and last night as well. So, so this can be a challenge for us. To begin with, in Paul's words, he says, at least for many people, there's a veil for them to be able to see and encounter the glory of God. We discover in chapter 3 that significantly due to the hardness of the Israelites' hearts and minds. And there's a link here. Our hearts can become hard to God. Anyone ever been in a period in their life where your heart's been hard to God? I think we've probably all been there. Whether that's because of hurt or pain or discouragement or someone said something to you, you got hurt in the church, you didn't understand something, you prayed for something, it didn't happen. There was just something you read in the Bible, you didn't get it. Whatever it is, our hearts can become hard towards God. And that hardness of heart is like a veil to be able to come into that encounter experience with the glory of God. In in chapter 4 then, we see that the veil can also have a spiritual dimension. So it's not just an inward wrestle to experience the glory of God. There's a spiritual battle too. It literally speaks about Satan blinding people to being able to see. We're not told exactly how that all happens, but there is some kind of spiritual conflict that goes along where he is trying to prevent us from engaging with the glory of God. Anyone ever had this where you think, you know what, New Year's resolution, I'm going to spend some extra time in prayer, okay? And then you get to the moment when you were going to do that, and just before that, someone does something to you that makes you so mad. You can't even believe that they did that to you. Just ahead of the time when you were going to have your prayer time with Jesus, did they not know how holy and important it is for you to kind of be in that encounter time, and now they've done this awful thing, or you're late, or something, and, and, and somehow... We get robbed of that moment. Now, sometimes that's just a natural consequence. But there is a spiritual battle that often is going on to, between you and being, you being in the very presence of God to encounter his glory. Because that is the mechanism by which we change on the inside. And the enemy will do everything he can to keep you from that space. And then lastly... We see one of the challenges we face is just the circumstances of our life, which can at times be rubbish. We can go through really rubbish seasons in our life where we face incredible loss, challenge, difficulty, hardship, the kind of wounding of other people to us. All of those things can be a hindrance to us engaging with and encountering Jesus. So how, in the midst of all that, do we do it? I hope that maybe you want to do that, that you want to bring yourself into a place where you really are engaging and encountering and being transformed by the glory of God. And we get the key in verse 16 okay, of, of chapter 3, which says this, but whenever a person turns, or some translations have it as returns, because the Greek word there is to make an about turn, that's the idea. So I make, I'm making a turn towards God. Whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. There is something about the intentional choice of turning our hearts towards God that in that moment removes, at least to some degree, the veil between us and the glory of of Jesus. The Amplified gets to this really well. Uh, translation of the Bible says, but whenever a person turns in repentance and faith to the Lord, because that's what's being spoken about here. It's this idea, I'm rethinking the way I'm living. There's a humility about this. Remember Moses, the most humble person alive at the time, and he walks face to face with God. There is this link between humility and repentance and trust which is perhaps the best synonym today for faith, that this repentance and humility and trust that ushers us in to encountering the glory of God. And every time we make that move, we get to see more of who he really is. And so cultivating this lifestyle of humility and repentance where it's easy to say sorry. So if you find repentance with God difficult... Here is, here is like the, the uh, you know, I, I can play golf um, and 
I'm okay at it occasionally. But a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll go to the gym and they'll strengthen their body so that they can do their sport better. Pick your sport, whatever it is, rowing, running. If you, you can do additional exercises that help you to actually do the thing you really want to do. Now, I don't want to spend time in the gym. I want to spend time on the golf course. But if I do do this, this is going to go better. Okay? If you struggle to do repentance with God, make it your priority to become excellent at saying sorry to others, to people. Because if you can't say sorry to people, if you can't repent to people who you can see, how are you going to do it with God that you can't? Okay? So, so this can be a great thing for you to, to focus on. Work on being repentant with others, and you will find it will suddenly give you the capacity you need, neurologically as well as spiritually, to be able to do that with God and with Jesus too. Sorry, that's not in my notes. So, so how, how do we do that? We're cultivating this life and lifestyle of trust and repentance. At, uh, and repentance. And as we do, we actually become more like Jesus. This is the plan. I hope, <laughs> you might think, gosh, Jason, you know, you need to do this more. <laughs> Maybe we all do. But in my times of encountering God, that I come away a more loving person, a more gracious person, a more joyful person, a happier person, more powerful in ministry, more humble in service, and actually more glorious. You know, you can actually spend time with some people, and it is like their face shines at a spiritual level. There is something about them, and you can almost know, you meet some people, and they haven't told you yet that they're a Christian, and there is a depth of connection that they have with God, and later on you find out they are, and you just think, I knew it already. I just, I could see it already. There is something about the way their soul has been transformed through spending time encountering Jesus that they are a person of brightness and light, and glory, and goodness. Now, those are sort of activities, but it goes, so, so, so what are the activities? It's like contemplative prayer can be a really helpful activity to be able to do this, because often when we pray, we're coming to God to ask him for things, which is great. You know, we're told to do that. Lord, um, would you provide the bread that I need for the day? That's important. But there is another way to pray that links into the verse we read, contemplating the Lord's glory. It's coming to God and praying and saying, Lord, help me to see you. My prayer is not for something. It's unto connection and relationship or worship like we were doing earlier. There's something about worship when we can do it for long enough that we can get out of our heads. Do you know what I mean by getting out of your head in worship where you're not thinking about the windows, the temperature, the, you know, what you're wearing, what the other person's wearing, that's a nice perfume. You know, whatever it is that you go, well, that's not. Uh, you know, uh, and we, we get out of our head enough to be relaxed in our bodies enough to let our hearts and soul get caught up with God. Worship is an amazing place for this to happen. Okay? Reading the scriptures, but not just reading to get a promise to go away or to have an argument to be able to say something to someone else, but reading the scriptures relationally where I'm saying, God, I know I need to repent. I, I know my heart needs to be shaped. I'm coming thinking God's going to change me through this moment? How can I transform and change and therefore come closer to Jesus? These are activities, but remember, in all of these things, it's this that makes the difference. Am I surrendering my heart to God and turning and reorienting to Jesus? Now, I think one of the things I love about this passage is on the one hand, you get this picture of how amazing life can be, that I literally can become glorious like Jesus. That's quite incredible for me to think. <laughs> and you can become glorious like Jesus. And yet, we have this incredible glory in earthen vessels. And, and there is this tension between our growth in God and our experience of the kingdom does not remove us from the pain of life and the hardship and challenge of life, but we get to experience the glory and goodness of God 
in the midst of even the most difficult times. And this is the power of the kingdom. John Mark Comer said this as he was talking on a similar subject. He said, one of the marks of psycho-spiritual growth, so sort of emotional, mental, spiritual maturity and growth, is the capacity to hold both sorrow and joy together at the same time in our lives. It's like at the same time, I'm sorrowful and I'm joyful. And actually, I hold the two together. And that is what God does significantly because he's joyful all the time, and yet his heart breaks for the evil that's in the world. He goes on to say, if you were to ask him how he was, and he were to answer truly, he would probably say every day he feels like his life is great and terrible at the same time, and that that is a mark of maturity. Anyone witness with that? (laughs) Okay. For Paul, maturity is not the absence of hardship, but it's understanding we know the glory of God in the midst of it, And that the pain is temporary, but the glory is eternal and forever. And that is our hope. And so he can say in in chapter chapter 4, verse 8, in affliction, in the midst of affliction, we can know the transforming power of engaging with the glory of God so that God empowers us not to be defeated by it, but to overcome in the midst of it. We don't stick our head in the sand. We weep and we cry, okay? and yet we know the glory and goodness and joy of the kingdom of God in us at the same time. Or we face tragedy and difficulty and loss, and it's confusing, and, and we don't understand it, and yet in the midst of that, confusion and we don't understand, we also have the joy of the Lord, which is our strength, working within us to protect our hearts. Or when people treat us unjustly, okay, when they attack us, when they say terrible things about us, anyone had that happen to them? You know, in your office, in your family, in the church, it happens everywhere because people are broken and stupid like me. <laughs> okay? We do terrible things, don't we, to other people. And so there is this climate of where, where people are wounded and damaged and we experience the, the affliction and that, that unjust treatment. And yet in the midst of that, which would be so isolating, we know that God is with us and we are not alone. And we can be healed and restored. We are struck down, wounded, depleted of energy. We feel like we are the end of ourselves. And yet we experience the restoration of the power of the Holy Spirit when we turn our eyes to Jesus and we know his glory and goodness. So epiphany. This is what epiphany is. It's it's through all of life's joys and hardships and losses and difficulties, and stress, and burnout, and depression, and mistreatment, that in the midst of that, we turn our heart to God, and we encounter his glory, and we are changed, and strengthened, and moved from one degree of glory to the next. So I want to pray, not just for a day of epiphany, (laughs) but a year of epiphany for us. A year of, and I'm not saying I'm praying for a year of all that horrible stuff. (laughs) You know, we've got to deal with that. I don't want to pray for more of it. But in the midst of it, as we journey through it as people, that we wouldn't let the circumstance of our lives dictate the inner well-being of our souls. Because the inner well-being of our souls can be transformed by encountering the glory of God. And we are changed and we are changed. Amen? I hope that sounds positive. Okay. Well, do you want to stand, and I'll pray for us. I'm not sure someone might need to help me and call Ryan to lead us in a closing song. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you that we so often see in the natural world around us images and parallels that help us to understand spiritual realities that otherwise would be above and beyond us. Thank you, Jesus, for the way that you would do this. You would would show us a natural reality and then help 
journey us into the spiritual power of it. And God, I thank you that you've given us almost this, this invitation, this testimony, this awareness that our lives can change and transform through our experiences, that the things we experience shape and change us for good and for hard, <laughs> for bad. And yet I thank you that as we encounter your glory, that we're not only changed at a neural biological level, but that our heart, soul, mind, spirit, emotions are transformed from one degree of glory to the next. That we do not have to be the same. This year does not have to be the same as last year. That there can be an increased capacity to learn to walk with you and in communion with you and to live with your love and hope and peace and power and life and light and glory and the ministry of the kingdom that can flow through us as the veil is removed every time we turn our hearts to you. And so, God, would you awaken us deeper and higher and richer into this spiritual experience. Give us, God, the, the will and discipline that's needed to put ourselves in the positions where we can posture our hearts to meet with you in this way. We want to meet with you, Jesus. We want to meet with you. And the more we do, the more we'll want to. <laughs> and the more we'll have the capacity to do it. So God, would you come, spirit of revelation, I pray, be poured out over us as a community. In Jesus' name, may we know your goodness in the land of the living, when the living is hard and when the living is great. That Jesus, you would be in our hearts, powerfully by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.